Welcome to the Practical Enneagram. Jason Stern is a writer and publisher living in the Hudson Valley of New York. He has studied and practiced in many inner work traditions with a grounding in the teachings of George Gurdjieff and the Fourth Way. Jason leads inner work groups in New York before the pandemic internationally and now online. I'm noticing that there is a certain gravitas to those with more of their human faculties online. Diamond Approach co-founder Karen Johnson calls it isness, I believe. Jason has a lot of isness. I found myself to be rather transfixed as he contacted his centres for the answers to my questions, which were obviously as fresh and revelationary to him as they were to me. Backstory to this interview is that John Lukovic had directed me to Jason when I told him I wanted someone on to discuss essence with me. I haven't been able to grasp some of these flavours of essence that are taught through the Enneagram. Essential harmony, for instance, associated with type 9 on the Enneagram, completely eludes me still. Jason was able to put to bed this little quandary. I haven't understood it because it is not meant to be understood, not by my personality anyways. Listen out for the very clear definition of presence. The distinctions between personality work and essence work that Jason draws and the purpose of the Gurdjieff movements. Gurdjieff and the Fourth Way has a whole methodology and technology for becoming normal, as Jason puts it. If you enjoy hearing from Jason, may I direct you to his collection of essays, Learning to be Human, which I found to be an extraordinarily edifying read. Jason's writing is, for me, exquisite. There's a very rare honesty. Over and out from this little worm. Enjoy the transmission. I hope that you receive it. about business, Jason, and what is your business in the world? Sure. Um, uh, I guess I would say primarily I'm an entrepreneur in, in the business world, and I, I tend to be the kind of person that is good at starting things uh, more than I'm good at maintaining or even completing them. Uh, and so I have a, a, a trail of projects that have begun. Mm-hmm. I, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, and it, it was just a, uh, it was a kind of a given that that would be the trajectory rather than pursuing a traditional job or career in established institutional environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first career was as a professional rock climber. Back in the, uh, in the mid-80s, I started climbing and uh, found that I had a talent for it. And, uh, dropped out of high school and, and started climbing cliffs around the world and was able to secure sponsorship from various uh, gear companies and Thanks. outdoor adventure companies. And uh, so that was, you know, when I was 16, 17. And, uh, and it was a great start because it really, you know, I was able to see the world and mm. meet lots of, lots of people in different countries and, and find my footing as a traveler. And then I settled down and uh, started working as a writer and a photographer for a a local newspaper in my town and uh, found that I had a real love for writing and for expression and for publishing. And, you know, it coincided with uh, connecting with the Gurdjieff teaching and finding a teacher in a community Mm -hmm. that I wanted to be a part of. And so I was part of a group that formed an intentional community around that time when I was about 19. Uh, so then shortly after that... Hello, um, cat, by the way. I've got a lovely close-up of, of your cat's face right now. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a distraction? Not at all. Her? No, no, no. Sorry, I've okay. distracted you, so... No worries. Yeah, so uh, uh, when I was in the community, I, I, I had the the impulse to uh, to begin a project and to start a business. And uh, having had a little bit of experience in publishing, realized that uh, I wanted to work in, in publishing and at least try starting something. So we, we started a magazine and uh, we called it Chronogram because a chronogram is a kind of code that is encrypted in or a date that's encrypted into a phrase. And so, you know, in, in, a, in essence, it's a, it's a 
an esoteric calendar event. And uh, so our goal was to uh, was to draw the, the kind of the hidden creative work out of the fabric of our community and, and, and let it see the light of day and expose that uh, otherwise hidden creative work to uh, the regional community where where I live in the Hudson Valley in mm. New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Chronogram was born and uh, that was um, in 1993. You know, very gradually it, it gained momentum and traction and and uh, over these just about 30 years has become a, a strong institution, a cultural institution in the community. And, and I think continued to do what it was meant to do, which is to be a source of nourishment for what I call the cultural bio. Mm. You know, I think of it in terms of almost like a living culture, like a kombucha scoby or, yeah. or yogurt culture or something that there's a life in humanity that is in a sense the, the atmosphere of humanity mm. um, and it's it's present particularly present at a certain scale of life which you would you might call a local a local society or a local economy mm. that is that there's there are people relating to one another, they're creating things together, they're creating things in response to each other, they're, they're creating small businesses that are an expression of their creative work, they're doing artistic work and community work. And that's part of a commons, mm -hmm. you know, just as the air and the water are part of a commons. This is, this is what could be called the cultural commons. Um, it's something that we all share and that we all partake of and that we all contribute to and we all participate in. So the role of Chronogram was to uh, be a support, um, an amplifier of that cultural commons, mm -hmm. uh, to, to put it succinctly, mm -hmm. um, to feed back into that system what what is positive and good in that system. And uh, from a kind of a spiritual standpoint, I would say that that cultural commons is the being of a community. Mm. You know, everything that it does, all of its activity is the personality. Mm. You know, it's GDP and its output and its uh, its its productivity is is its personality. Its being is its atmosphere is its uh, its its substance, really the essence of a community. And so the role of chronogram was to really was to serve the essence of the the community in which in which we lived. Gosh, that's so beautiful. And are you still very active in Chronogram? You're still writing the column? Yeah, yeah, I still write the column. Uh, I'm not involved with Chronogram day to day mm -hmm. anymore. I, I, uh, I started the magazine with my then girlfriend and now life partner. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it was our first child together. Mm -hmm. And we take turns running it, really. So uh, when, when she had her actual physical children, yeah. I, I took over as the full-time publisher of Chronogram, uh, and when they got a bit older, she stepped in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we go back and forth. We play different roles within the organization and bring a different emphasis as the as the needs arise. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. You've involved yourself in spiritual work and traditions from, from an early age for one reason or another, I guess, may or may not have something to do with being a sexual nine. Actually, Jason, I'd just love to hear what, what, what do you think the fuel for that was initially and then ongoingly? I think that's a mystery for everyone mm -hmm. who has an interest in, in deeper matters. Some have it and some don't. And why that is, is mysterious. Mm -hmm. Is it related to our essential design? Is it related to certain kinds of experiences or conditioning that we have? I don't know. But I do know that, you know, I, I had a, a strange and intense childhood. Mm -hmm. you know, my uh, parents split up when I was two years old. My mother moved to a off-grid commune in, uh, near near the the Canadian border and became a, you know, a, a full fledged hippie. <laughs> and, um, my father became an ultra Orthodox Hasidic Jew. <laughs> and so I, so I had this beautiful polarity of going back and forth between a kind of an intense kind of pagan revolutionary Bacchanalian environment mm -hmm. to a very conservative 
uh, and deeply religious environment with my father. Uh, and I and I and I think that was that was formative in the sense that they they both held an aspect of a deeper way of seeing things, and they were also both in a sense rejecting the common paradigms, mm. the, uh, the conventional approach to things. And, and so I was very comfortable rejecting the conventional. Mm, mm. What is it that drew me? Um, I was drawn when I, when I met my first teacher and I heard the Gurdjieff of teachings, something in them run deeply true. And it, it answered many questions for me about why the world seems to be so uh, upside down mm. and absurd like the values that are held by the world in general are feel so contrary to what i experience as true the gurdjieff teaching addressed that and sort of uh, gave me a, a praxis by which to inquire into some of those absurdities and to to what actually may be the real possibilities for myself and others. Mm -hmm. Alongside this seeking and, and, and thirst for spiritual, I suppose, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, have you involved yourself much in the personality or psychological side of development? And how has that looked? I've done a fair bit of psychological work alongside inner work practices mm -hmm. and, and, and at, at different stages. And I uh, I see them as different activities. You know, many times psychological work is mixed up with inner work, and uh, in some cases, gracefully. For instance, in the diamond approach, I think yeah. there's a harmonious combination of psychological teaching and genuine inner work teaching, and the diamond approach is able to bring them together and at the same time keep them separate, which is is pretty remarkable that they're they're not conflated. Yeah. Um, in my experience, periodically doing uh, periods of, of psychotherapy has been invaluable in um, taking steps in my inner work. Mm. But it really comes down to the understanding of the difference between essence and personality, mm. that there's, there's a work on our functional side and there's a work on our being side. Mm. And, and they really need to proceed hand in hand. And they're different kinds of work. Ideally, they serve each other. You know, but to, to understand that and get a taste for the difference between essence and personality is a, is a really fundamental thing. Mm. Uh, and it's something that we all can taste. And I think, it, I think that we naturally understand that difference. And, and when we recognize it, it's clear. Um, working with presence is coming in contact with essence. What is presence? Presence is a direct contact with the media of my inner life here and now. Without the mediation of concepts or thoughts or meet or deriving meaning, it's simply being here with myself now as I am in a kind of a rigorous way, keeping my attention in the media of my inner life. Mm. Can I be in contact with sensation in my body? Can I be present in this? miasma of feeling in my chest can i be present in my mind in thought even as my mind is thinking mm. to be in contact with that is is to be in contact with with our essence truly the moment we try to make it into something is then bringing it into the realm of personality the moment i try to you know identify it with my type on the mm. in the enneagram system or the moment that i try to uh, evaluate myself on the basis of my experience, immediately we've moved into the realm of personality. So the work has to be in, in balance. Any, anytime we undertake a practice that has a form, we're bringing something into our personality, we're developing something in our personality, which is the capacity to practice something. Personality is where we learn things. It's, it's, it's an appurtenance. It's it's an incredibly sophisticated mechanism for taking on patterns and developing skills. Mm -hmm. When those skills serve the development of essence, then personality is working in the right way. When personality becomes dominant 
and we believe that those skills are who I am, that what I think I know is who I am, that my knowledge is my identity, mm. then personality is in the wrong, it's in the wrong place in the scheme. You know, for right work to happen, essence needs to be active and personality an instrument for, for presence, for being, mm -hmm. for essence. So yes, yeah, psychological work and being work were, are, uh, need to proceed hand in hand. And, and the development of personality is, is crucial. You know, it, it, in a certain way, the beginning of our work, we, you know, we use personality as material with which to struggle. Mm. Sometimes that can be conflated with the judgment that personality is bad. And that's not the, that's not the point. Personality is neither good nor bad. It either serves our aim or it doesn't serve our aim. But from a practical standpoint, the beginning of inner work involves a struggle with personality. It's create in order to create a friction, mm -hmm. because it's that friction that begins to heat the soup, that begins to cook the mixture, that begins to allow essence to be liberated. So if I notice that. I habitually hold tension in my shoulders. And that's something that's learned. To struggle with that holding of tension is a way of liberating energy that might go directly into presence, liberating the grip of the, the unconscious grip of, of the habits of personality. And that's a basic one that begins in the body. And then there are, there are, there are many steps. There are many um, tactics, strategies, practices that we can use to begin to utilize personality to serve something deeper and to to reshape personality to be truly a, a servant of of our being mm, thank you that was so clear learning to be human your your book which is a collection of the um essays or columns that you were writing is probably best described as a work of spiritual act is activism that collection of essays would you describe it that way yes yeah okay good <laughs> but also accounts of the essential experience or the experience of waking up in everyday life through your writing i felt like the essential experience was being elucidated is that part of your intention when you're writing well what is your intention when you're when you're writing the columns my intention is to convey my experience of inner work as truthfully as I can. Mm. Why I do that, I don't know precisely. I have a feeling, a sense that it's good. I, I, I have no impulse to convince anybody of anything. Mm. I'm not selling books. I mean, I, mm. I published a book, but I, you know, I'm not doing it to sell stuff. I'm doing it because it's the best that I can do, mm. that is to broadcast a sound uh, of struggling with myself mm. in, and, and of working in all of the different contexts of my life. And it's a difficult task to find a voice that's really sincere. And, and mm. the way that I can do it is by not worrying about it. Mm. That is, you know, do I sound preachy? I don't know. Mm. Do I sound self-deprecating i don't know i'm just telling it as i as i'm experiencing it from my own understanding and um and it's and it really is just a an exercise that comes out of an aphorism from gurdjieff which is that here and now in this moment we can repair the past and prepare the future and in a sense this is the only place that that can happen right now if i'm to the degree that i'm working and struggling, working to be present here and now is the degree to which I am digesting and metabolizing the karma of the past and preparing something more pure and finer for the future. Mm. Who that serves, I don't know. Mm. What that serves, I don't know. And in a way, I can't afford the resources to even consider that. I can only do my best. Yeah. And so those columns are, are in that spirit. It's just to put to put out a certain vibration, a certain logos of inner work into the into the neosphere, mm. you know, into the into the collective mind space, mm. so that it's and, and if it's useful to someone uh, and it 
it provides nourishment for their magnetic center, mm. then I've served my purpose. Mm, mm, mm. Are you familiar with the way essence is taught in the Enneagram worlds, Jason? So with essential qualities linked with specific types? Uh, is this related to the holy ideas? Um, yeah, and also... Almas, the um, the Diamond Approach guy, <laughs> founder, he's written a book recently, Keys to the Enneagram, where he's describing the essential aspects of each of the nine types and then the ego ideals. I was just curious to know well, what your observations are in dicing essence up that way and assigning essence to particular types on the Enneagram. Well, I'm, I don't want to disappoint you, but I I don't see value in dicing essence. Mm. I see value in inhabiting essence, in being in contact with essence, in making discoveries about essence and essence qualities. Mm. To use a system to try to map essence is a slippery slope because it's using personality to try to understand essence. Mm. And personality simply doesn't have the subtlety to, to grasp what essence is. Mm. Um, I think the diamond approach comes the closest to using a system to approach essence of any system that I've seen because it focuses so much on the praxis of inquiry. Mm. This working with inquiry as a mode of self-observation is incredibly potent mm. incredibly potent and it reveals it's in the spirit of it's of the scientific scientific method it's it's asking again and again what is this what is this not analytically but experientially mm. there may be an answer that arises but then the immediate approach is then to ask again what is this to come into a deeper contact with what is and perhaps a meaning crystallizes and perhaps it doesn't it's connected to the teacher uh, Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. he, he was he was a, a teacher of Advaita Vedanta, you could say. And uh, although I don't think he called it that in his teaching, he just taught. And the primary practice in in what he taught was this self inquiry of asking, "Who am I?" Mm -hmm. In the practice of asking, "Who am I?" You know, we quickly are able to discard all of the descriptors. The principle of of, of self-observation or inquiry is that if I can see something, I know that it is not I. And this is a, ge this is a geometry in it, really, a linear geometry in the sense that I am the one who is seeing. Mm. If I can see something, I know it is not I. Mm. So this process of inquiry of asking, who am I, immediately reveals my descriptors, my name, my occupation, my gender, my religion, my economic status, my Enneagram type, mm. you know, all, all of these descriptors I immediately see, these are not I. And then I begin to go into a deeper experience and I begin to notice I see my body. And so I, and I know that my body is not I. I know that my emotions are not I. I can see my emotions. I know that my thoughts are not I. And this process of inquiry allows of going deeper and deeper and deeper into levels or layers of of our nature that is progressively less and less conditioned and uh, more and more universal, more and more transpersonal uh, and more energetic. Um, I do think that the Enneagram personality typing system is a very useful lens for self-observation. Um, you know, I, uh, over the last 10 years, I've done a lot of teaching with Russ Hudson. He and I had, uh, he invited me to teach the Gurdjieff work in a program that he offers on, on inner work and the Enneagram. And I, so I've been a, I've gotten a, uh, an immersive mm -hmm. introduction to, to the Enneagram system, mm -hmm. personality system. Um, and I've seen a couple of things. One is I've seen for myself how valuable that lens can be in coming to uh, self-acceptance and self-understanding. Mm. And I've seen how people who are introduced to the Enneagram, some portion of them are stimulated or drawn to go deeper. Mm. That is to say, it's 
that serves as material for their magnetic center, which magnetic center is meant to draw a person to a source of genuine inner work. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that that, that the world of, the, of Enneagram personality, at least Russ Hudson's world, um, is effective at bringing people to the threshold of the possibility of inner work. Mm -hmm. So well said, yeah. And I want to um, draw you on Gurdjieff teachings as many of them are transmitted through your essays and they would be because they form part of your uh, body of wisdom. Is Let's assume listeners know who Gurdjieff is. Are you able to, Jason, share some of the major tenets of Gurdjieff philosophy or is that too difficult a, a task to do in our time? I'll take it on. <laughs> Great. Well, Gurdjieff presented a set of ideas, theories about psychology and about cosmology. What he said is that psychology and cosmology are not separate things, that they are the same thing because the cosmos is represented in human nature, that the cosmos is a vast transformational apparatus that is continuously transforming base materials into finer materials and it's it's a living system of transformation and so too is the human being at least in potential so we we have this instrument this three centered instrument that takes in three types of food mm. and the instrument is designed to transform those three foods in a way that liberates and produces finer energies finer vibrations, finer emanations. Mm. And, that, and that when these finer energies are present, there is the possibility of becoming conscious of aspects of our nature that are otherwise dormant. Mm. That there, there's instruments within the greater instrument that are capable of completely different modes of perception and relation and action very different from our, what we experience as our ordinary selves. And that fulfilling that, the possi that possible evolution, which is inherent to being human, mm. it isn't somebody's idea of what we should be. It is that our nature defines this, the, the teaching, Gurdjieff's teaching, and many other spiritual traditions, each in their own language, or describes the possibility that is inherent within our design, within our nature, for development, for evolution. So Gurdjieff taught that human beings have a role to play within the broader ecosystem of the cosmos, that three centered beings have a certain role to play, which is to contribute a, a certain quality of emanations into the ecosystem. Mm. Each being and life form within the ecosystem tends to contribute what it is meant to. The plants and animal life are crystallized as what they are, and they contribute an emanation from that nature. We don't necessarily contribute the correct emanations. Mm because we don't necessarily live in a collected state of three centers working together. Mm. We live much of the time as in the equivalent of a one-centered being. So you can say a human being emanating like a worm, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, at the level of a two-centered being, which is to say a human being emanating at the level of a sheep and perhaps even behaving in the manner of a sheep. So a three-centered being is emanating a different quality of, of material into the ecosystem. It's possible to develop something beyond that, the natural state of a human being, but our, the, the, the first stage of inner work is to come to be able to emanate as a human being and take our place within and serve within the context of this greater ecosystem of which we are a part. Mm. So Gurdjieff gave a bunch of different kinds of exercises and practices for how, how to first of all become normal mm. and then to begin to develop something uh, ex more extraordinary. Mm. But the first stage is that 
work of becoming normal, which is to say, balancing out our centers within a vessel of presence. I could go on. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, you are leading inner work retreats. Is that accurate at the moment? What happens in those? So are you doing teaching like you've been doing now? Are you doing the movements? Just curious to know what the process is and what, what those are like and what who they attract. Yeah, so the practical work is primarily meeting together regularly and and you know traditionally a group will meet once a week and and occasionally for longer retreats uh the fundamental aspect of the fourth way and i and and i say fourth way because that's what gurdjieff called his teaching Mm -hmm. uh, as distinct from the the three ways of the way of the body and the way of the emotions the devotional way and the way of the mind the yogi way of knowledge Mm -hmm. that the three that the fourth way is meant to be carried out in life that it is not a a tradition that requires that a person who enters it does the hardest thing first of all Mm -hmm. and that hardest thing is giving up connection with ordinary life Mm -hmm. you know giving up worldly ambitions and giving up family and becoming a renunciate first thing the fourth way is meant to be carried out in life but with uh the same kind of seriousness and rigor that one would expect from a monk entering a monastery or a yogi going into the jungle for 30 years so it's meant to be carried out in life and you know ideally right within the conditions of each personal life each of our own life because our lives are are very much a reflection of our of our being Mm. you know to be working in life and with the features of our life is is to be working with our being Mm. in in a natural way rather than going off somewhere to do inner work and leaving everything behind it's much more effective albeit much more difficult Mm to do inner work right in the midst of life. So all of our conditions are designed to support the person doing inner work in life. Um, So we meet regularly and we use those meetings to transmit certain exercises. Gurdjieff taught a lot a large body of inner exercises that are practiced for 45 minutes or so each morning. Mm, That's a long time. A big commitment of a practice, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, people don't begin at 45 minutes usually. You know, we'll begin with a 20-minute exercise and gradually work up to it. But it's meant to be a daily commitment to inner work, mm-hmm. kind of first thing in the day, that I'm setting myself to do inner work first thing, and I'm, in a way, creating a kind of a monastery in my schedule. Like, I'm going on retreat for these 40 minutes, and I'm just going to do inner work. And these, uh, these exercises are remarkable technologies for working with attention, working with presence in very precise ways, under coming, really coming to understand what presence is as an experience, not just as a word, and coming in contact with some of these latent capacities for relating to our higher centers. What is it to open to, to open the higher emotional center? You know, something, a, a level of, intelligence that's within us that's generally completely unconscious because we don't have the energy to attune to that level of functioning which is which is in us Mm. so we work with cultivating that energy and kind of opening the the window to the higher emotional center and coming in contact with with these i will call them essence qualities or higher emotions that don't belong to us but can be that can come to us by grace and through receptivity and the higher intellectual center which is something completely other so it's important you know just speaking about the the kind of conditions and the terms of our work that we we understand that that inner work we think of the word work and we think it's always a kind of active forcing type of current In, in this tradition we understand that there can be an active work passive work and a reconciling work Mm. and when i say passive i don't mean like inert i mean receptive so that there's a place for an effort a strenuous effort even and even either alternately or even at the same time there's a receptivity completely open receptivity and 
perhaps in the midst of that comes in a reconciling force, which is what we call the third force or, or grace. Mm-hmm. So we do, uh, so we work with sittings, we work with Gurdjieff movements, which is uh, again, a, a remarkable technology for both coming to self-knowledge and for developing a power of attention and a power of inner coherence. That is to say, can I can I be in, an, in an, a very active and demanding situation that requires great attention and precision and keep my centers in line with each other? So it's a it's a remarkable thing because it's this both a rigorous outer work and a and simultaneously a rigorous inner work. So it's this the movements are kind of a a launching pad for inner work in life. If we can work with movements, we can we can work while we're driving our car or you know interviewing our subject or shoveling the snow or writing whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we also work with some some amount of study of certain texts from the tradition. Um, Gurdjieff's book, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, An Impartially Objective Criticism of the Life of Man, is one book that we, <laughs> it's a mouthful. And, um, oh, that's one book. And, that's the title. Yes. Well, can you say it again? Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, or an impartially objective criticism of the life of man, which is the first of three books in a series called All and Everything. Mm. One more thing I'll say about the, our method and right, the way that we work together in groups is the emphasis on maintaining a balance between theory and practice. Mm. This tradition and really any, I think, real inner work tradition is an oral tradition. It's not to say that information cannot be gleaned from texts, but rather that there's a certain possibility in the transmission of knowledge through the medium of sound Mm. that is not available through the transmission of words on a page, that something, something is communicated from the human instrument to the human instrument through the medium of sound that's more than the information that it contains it's a kind of a dimensional increase of bandwidth an exponential increase of bandwidth of information so we it's so it's an oral tradition and it's it's also a tradition that proceeds within the context of groups so that the group has the opportunity to put knowledge into practice in a manner that allows that knowledge to be transmuted into understanding through experience, mm. right? Like you can sit down and you can read, you know, Wisdom of the Enneagram, mm. or you can read In Search of the Miraculous. And how much of it do you can you assimilate or remember plowing through a book? Yeah. Very little. Very little, yeah. So we, we work with ideas um, over fairly long spans of time. Mm. And really, really look at and, and try to put certain teachings into practice. Mm-hmm. So I'll just give you one example, even though we're running running short of time, no, just because we got... need a we need a practical example. Oh, we do. I'd love one. Thank you. So, so a practical example is that this we have a faculty within us called attention, mm. and you know, of course. Our society and our world understands the value of attention, and it, and and in the commercial commercial world, brands are always vying for our attention, paying a lot of money for our attention. What we what we aren't taught is that attention is something that we can develop and that we can make our own for our, for our being. So we first of all observe the state of our attention throughout the day. You know, we notice. When is my attention captured by something such that I have, for all intents and purposes, I have disappeared. All of my attention is now absorbed in that object which has captured it, with which I have become identified in a certain way. Uh, I notice another stage of attention, which is to say that when my attention is aroused, right, I'm interested in something, giving it attention because it's caught my interest, I'm still here but I'm giving my attention because it's it's being drawn uh, by something that's giving me something back. Mm. 
it's not just captured, it's actually, it's aroused and in a way productive. You know, I, I noticed that my attention can, can be directed, which is to say, I have the possibility of choosing to place my attention on something and hold it there for no other reason than to work with my attention. So generally, we will work with something like part of the body and coming in contact with sensation in the body, keeping my attention, for instance, in my hands. And I notice very quickly how little I can do that the moment I remember, I just as quickly forget. And that's where it there begins to be the possibility of developing the attention that begin with seeing the difficulty I have with keeping my attention inward. I then am faced with a, with a real observation of myself. And from that real observation, I can begin to work. I can't really work until I see, at least I have a glimpse of how things are. So I see the state of my attention and then I can begin to struggle and I can begin to work with my attention. From the standpoint of inner work, it's to keep attention inward, to keep some attention inward, not on what I think and what I feel and what I'm experiencing, but with the presence of the presence that's behind the contents of my centers. So that's an example. And, and then we'll work with little exercises with attention, like for instance, as you know, in connection with, with the sound, when I'm speaking, can I have some of my attention aware of the sound that I'm making rather because you know of course the sound is the medium that's transmitting my meaning from my voice to your ears it's the sound that is the being of communication the me the words that's just the personality of communication you know the sound is the essence of communication it's the being so can I keep some of my attention on the sound that I'm making and can I and when I'm listening can I listen to the sound of the other and listen to hear where it is where is the sound resonating in that person mm. it's not to say that i disregard the words and the meaning that they're trying to convey but what i notice is that when i keep my attention with the sound that part of my intelligence which registers meaning just works by itself i don't have to try to grok what they're saying my mind does that really well all by itself where my attention belongs is with the quality of the sound that is is emanating from the, from myself or the other. Mm. An, an example of, of practice. Yeah. <laughs> I thank you so much for for spending this time with me. It's been so rich. Thank you for your interest and um, it's been a pleasure. My next victim is fellow Brit psychotherapist and couples counsellor Rosemary Cohen. We'll be talking about relationships.